everyone. So I hope and I trust that you can all hear me fine and you've all been doing well. Um, I'm not going to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, because we are at least in three different time zones right now. Um, and the very fact that people have joined from all these different places, um, like it indicates how important the seminar is. Um, and I'm extremely thankful to our speakers, um, Mr. Carlo Fernandez and Lucy Zhu. Um, we're taking out time, you know, despite this being so close to Christmas and all the end of the year finals and all those assignments coming up. Um, and they agreed to do it because um, I think we all realize how timely and how relevant uh, this topic is, especially you know now with all the all the different like schedule, um, scheduled vaccines for the high risk groups about to be rolled out and have actually already been rolled out in many countries. Um, so let me give you a brief background um, about our speakers. Um, so first off, they're here because they wrote one of the most comprehensive reviews on COVID vaccines. Um, got published in British Journal of uh, Clinical Pharmacology. Um, and actually like I've been following this topic like you know for, for ages now and I've, I haven't read anything more concrete, uh, comprehensive um, and informative um, compared to that. So that is why I requested them to be here. Um, now Esther is, um, is an alumnus of University of Barcelona uh, she is already a licensed pharmacist um, in, the, in the European Union, and now she is in Columbia, New York, um, pursuing like her third, second or third doctoral degree, which is fascinating. Um, and she is joined by Lucy Zhu um, from University of Toronto, now currently also based in Columbia, New York. Um, they are both doing fantastic work in their respective fields. Um, but today they are going to focus more on this very important topic of COVID vaccines. Um, so I would just appreciate if all of you stay on mute uh, throughout. Uh, do send us your questions to the chat. I already have a few questions, but I'll include, try to include as many as possible uh, during our Q and A. Um, and yeah, let's let's uh, let's look forward to an excellent engage engagement. So over to you, Esther and Lucy. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen. Can everyone see this okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, awesome. So thank you again for the introduction. Um, Esther and I are obviously very excited to be speaking here today. Um, we're going to give a brief overview of just the vaccine landscape in general so far during this pandemic. And then we'll take a closer look at the two main vaccines that I'm sure are on everyone's minds. And then we can chat a little bit about what um, the future might look for all of us moving forward. Um, but first, I was gonna start with a little bit about who we are, but we were introduced so well. Um, but just to recap, yeah, I did my undergrad and master's in biochemistry at the University of Toronto. Um, Esther, who you'll be hearing from next, did her PharmD from the University of Barcelona, and she actually worked for a few years as a research associate at Michigan University afterwards. And then it was in 2019 that we both came to Columbia to start our PhDs, and we're currently second year students in a department of pathobiology and cell biology. So earlier this year, we also joined different labs. Um, so I'm currently studying post-transcriptional regulation in the context of obesity and adipose tissue. Um, Esther's joined a cancer lab and she's currently developing a single cell seek system to study gliomas from patients um, to predict personalized medicine options. So we're not experts in viruses or vaccines or the immune system or any of that. Um, we're just two students with a background in biology um, and an interest in um, vaccines and in COVID in general. And we've sort of been following up some of the research in the last couple of months. Um, and so we'd just like to share with you some of the things that we've learned. Um, okay, so first of all, what is SARS-CoV-2 and where did it come from? So coronaviruses are part of a larger group of po positive single-stranded RNA viruses called nidoviruses. And these viruses all have non-human hosts. But for reasons that we don't completely understand yet, um, these viruses are better at jumping between species than may be otherwise expected. So for example, Toro viruses here are primarily known for being viruses that are found in cows, but they can also be found um, in pythons. 
And Roni viruses down here are found in all sorts of different crustaceans. The coronavirus family is further split into four subcategories, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And alpha and beta are primarily uh, derived from murine hosts and also bats. Uh, gamma and delta coronaviruses are primarily from avian hosts. So to date, there are seven coronaviruses have been found in the human population. Four of them, shown here in blue, lead to just the common cold. And actually, they are in fact very common. They're like 30% of the common colds. So everyone here has probably gotten at least one of these once. Um, the other three um, here in red is SARS, uh, the SARS causing SARS-CoV-1, the MERS causing MERS-CoV, and the COVID-19 causing SARS-CoV-2. Um, and these three have obviously been capable of significantly impacting our lives in the last decade or so. And indeed, as of yesterday, um, the WHO has reported over 75 million confirmed COVID cases and over 1.6 confirmed deaths across 222 countries. And unfortunately, with cases rising across the world, and especially in the Americas and in Europe, um, it doesn't look like this virus will be stopping anytime soon. So for this reason, many of us have been relying on the promise of a COVID-19 vaccine to put an end to the pandemic. And there's been a significant push, of course, um, in the scientific field to develop one. Um, and so you've probably heard people talking about an accelerated vaccine pipeline or accelerated vaccine development pipeline. Um, but how exactly does that work? And how exactly is the pipeline being accelerated? So everyone's here is probably somewhat familiar with the concept of a normal development pipeline. Looks something like this. Um, both drugs and vaccine development begins with a preclinical stage. At the preclinical stage, um, most of the work is done in animal models um, or in in vitro models. And you often start off with just the very basics of vaccine design. So at this stage, um, pharmaceutical companies or groups may choose to test out a couple of different designs um, to make sure it has the expected effect and to make sure that it's not immediately toxic. And this process usually takes two years in a normal um, vaccine or drug development pipeline. And now, after anything that passes through the preclinical stage, we'll go on to phase one testing. And phase one testing is the first step of human trials. It's usually done with less than 100 people. And because it's the first time um, a, a compound will be tested in people, uh, these trials are often completed very, very carefully. Uh, sorry, they're often completed very, very carefully. And they usually take place in a hospital where doctors can keep track of participants at all times. So phase one testing primarily looks at safety and reactogenicity. So at this stage, you can be trying out different concentrations of your drug of interest or your vaccine of interest to figure out what is sort of the safety limit. Um, and here is also when the, they might start to test different dosing schedules or test different formulations to determine if, for example, an adjuvant can be added safely. After phase one trials, they'll move on to phase two trials. And phase two is broken up into two stages. Phase two A is usually a couple hundred people. Um, and at this stage, we're further confirming safety and reactogenicity. Um, but we're also confirming um, the dose and the dosing strategy that should be used. Um, phase two B is a larger trial of maybe a couple thousand people. And this is really essentially just a trial that is made to prepare for phase three trials. So at this point, you can start to collect some early efficacy data, um, but primarily phase 2b is meant to determine the appropriate experimental endpoints for further phase three trials. And also because in phase 2b, you get to start to ramp up production, um, you do a test at this point to make sure that you're able to produce um, the vaccine that you're like planning to use um, and have batch consistency from batch to batch. So this entire process of phase two trials usually takes two years. After that, phase three trials um, are often conducted with tens of thousands of people. And at this point is where you really monitor for vaccine efficacy um, with controlled and double-blinded experiments. And obviously with the larger group of people, all participants are also being monitored for side effects. And in order to uh, determine long-term side effects, um, both in terms of safety and in terms of the vaccine long-term efficacy, phase three trials often take quite a few years. Um, and during this time, as more and more people are being enrolled, companies can also work on updating its infrastructure and its manufacturing um, so that it can be prepared um, for this, to, to put this drug on the market once it's ready. So finally, even after a vaccine enters the market, 
Um, there could be additional phase four trials uh, often conducted to get further safety and efficacy data um, or to compare um, the vaccine in question with other treatments. So in total, the traditional vaccine development type timeline can take over 10 years to complete. And this is time we simply don't have during the pandemic. So the current pipeline in use for vaccine development is one that's been essentially condensed into one or two years. And this is made by doing a lot of steps in parallel. Um, and in this process, um, as you'll see later on as well, um, a lot of groups do choose to combine uh, preclinical and phase one steps or phase one, two or phase two, three. Um, pharmaceutical companies have also been relying on a lot of technologies that they already have or things that they've already been trying or testing prior for SARS, Zika or H1N1. So this does cut down on some of the design um, time that you would need for preclinical trials. Other than that, you'll notice that all the human trials are of course much shorter. Um, to compensate for this, um, the idea is to have continued phase four pharmacovigilance um, so that pharmaceutical companies and also regulating bodies can continue to respond to new data as it comes in. Um, but essentially this accelerated vaccine development timeline is focused on making sure that a vaccine with good efficacy and good safety can reach um, the general population faster than it otherwise would it, uh, we would expect. Okay, so now we know how long it takes to make a vaccine. How do we go about making one? Well, this has a lot to do with the biology of the SARS-CoV-2 viral particle. So very simply, this virus has an outer coat made up of envelope proteins, spike gly glycoprotein, and also viral lipid um, envelope um, lipids. Um, inside, there is, of course, the viral positive single-stranded RNA and also a nucleocapsid proteins. The spike protein here is the main viral component that interfaces with the host. So the spike is a homotrimer and it forms um, with a receptor binding domain shown here pink um, sticking out. And this receptor binding domain can take two forms. It can be in, in the down state, as you can see here, or it can be in the up state, as you can see here. Um, when one of the receptor binding domains are, is facing the up conformation, it's free to bind to a host receptor protein. And this act catalyzes the globular half of the protein. So like this section up here, um, and it causes it to sort of break off from the rest of the trimer. And once one of the receptor binding domains is released, the other two kind of are catalyzed off as well. And that releases this linear um, area that we call the S2 portion of the spike protein. And the S2 portion um, contains a fusion protein down here in red that is capable of sort of embedding itself into the lipid membrane of the host cell and kind of pulling the lipid membrane of the host with the viral membrane um, until the two membranes are able to fuse. And that allows the viral um, protein or it allows the, viral, the virus to insert its genome into the host. Okay, so for SARS-CoV-2, the host protein it recognizes is a protein called human ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, once it's inside the cell, it can obviously replicate its RNA and its protein components. Um, it resembles inside the cell and releases back to spread infection further in, into the body. Now, thankfully, this doesn't go unnoticed. Um, as a basic overview to the immune system, all pathogens, including viruses, are initially recognized by um, parts of the innate immune system antigen presenting cells. And these cells are able to engulf and break down the virus and present portions of it to intruder uh, or present portions of the intruder to T cells. And CD4 positive T cells, also known as helper T cells, are activated by these antigen presenting cells. And they secrete cytokines that can activate, among other factors, killer CD8 T cells, which then go on to recognize and kill any infected host cells. Activated CD4 positive cells are also capable of activating B cells, which go on to produce neutralizing antibodies that can bind and inhibit the virus from further infecting host cells. And as the infection is eventually brought under control, some of these B cells also become memory B cells. And that allows the body to sort of come back and make this antibody if it ever sees the same pathogen again. So in the case of COVID-19, it was determined fairly early on that people who recover from COVID-19 have circulating antibodies against that spike protein. Um, and therefore the spike protein was identified as the main primary target for vaccine design. So there are four main platforms um, when designing vaccines that can be picked. 
and I'll briefly introduce them now um, and some of the examples that exist in each platform. Um, so the most basic one is our the traditional attenuated or inactivated um, vaccine platform. And this, event, this essentially consists of a whole viral particle that's been inactivated or attenuated by chemical means. Um, these uh, vaccines are highly immunogenic because they are made or they consist of the whole viral particle. Um, but it's very difficult sometimes to make them because it requires a lot of live virus um, that gets you know, attenuated or inactivated in the lab. And so there's a certain amount of danger and there's a certain amount of risk of sort of making large amounts of these vaccines. Um, and of course, if the viral particle isn't fully inactivated, there's also some pathogenic risk as well. Um, so this is the most basic uh, vaccine platform used today. And the majority of the vaccines that we have actually do come from this platform. And that includes uh, vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, polio, rabies, yellow fever, and also our seasonal influenza vaccines. The second is viral vector vaccines. And these are uh, adenoviruses that have been transformed to express the target antigen. So the adenoviruses themselves um, are uh, essentially viruses that normally would cause a common cold that has further been attenuated to prevent you know, any pathogenicity. So these compared to traditional, uh, compared to the traditional uh, pathway um, are much safer to produce and they have less pathogenic risk. Um, but the efficacy of these may vary due to existing adenovirus immunity in certain parts of the population. Um, these platforms are currently being used to design vaccines against Ebola, Zika virus, and HIV. The third and the one that people are probably most excited about right now is nucleic acid vaccines. And these are viral DNA or RNA um, particles um, that get sent into the body in a lipid nanoparticle to induce a host cell antigen expression. So instead of having the virus or the vaccine itself introduce um, the spike protein to you, it introduces the genetic material so that your body can make the spike protein. Um, these vaccines are safe, easy, and fast to make. So it's basically just the PCR. Um, there's essentially no pathogenic risk to make them. Um, but unfortunately, if they're made with RNA, of course, we know RNA is unstable. So there's a certain amount of um, difficulty with that. And if it's made with DNA, then the vaccine needs to not only enter the cell, but it also needs to enter the nucleus. So that often requires an additional gene gun step um, to get it into the nucleus. Uh, there are currently no nucleic acid vaccines um, available on the market, um, but there has been a lot of uh, developmental or experimental work done in Zika H1N1 and H5N1. The final is protein subunit vaccines, and these are vaccines that consist of viral surface proteins that have been uh, assembled in vitro. So these surface proteins are often made um, from bacteria or from mammalian cell lines um, and then assembled in vitro to form um, essentially the viral envelope without anything inside it. So they're very safe and easy to make, of course, because you're only operating with um, the proteins and they're obviously not capable of reproducing um, and they have no pathogenic risk. Um, however, they may not very accurately represent viral antigen because um, anyone who um, purifies proteins may know um, certain things don't fully fold properly in vitro. Um, certain vaccines with this platform include the vaccine for HPV and the universal flu vaccine that is currently in development. Um, at the same time, um, using these four platforms, more than 100 vaccines are currently in varying stages of human development. Um, so far, two have been approved for full use, and these are the ones that we've been hearing about, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, uh, which is an mRNA vaccine, and the Moderna mRNA vaccine. Um, there's been also a total of six vaccines currently in limited use around the world. And there are, of course, many up and coming vaccines as well. Um, I've just introduced three here, um, AstraZeneca viral vec vector vaccine, whose interim results are already out, um, and Johnson & Johnson's viral vector, as well as Novavax's a protein subunit vaccine, um, where we can expect results um, early next year in January. So how are all of these vaccines being tested? Well, the easiest way to test vaccine efficacy is through a viral challenge. And this is where you vaccinate, um, then challenge with the virus, and then see if the vaccine helps 
to prevent sub subsequent infection. And of course, there are a lot of ethical issues behind biochallenge trials in humans, so this has mostly been limited to animal models. In human trials, then, we maintain a vaccine treated in the placebo-treated population, the same geographical area, and over a period of time, check to see if the vaccine treated group has had a lower natural occurrence rate of catching the virus compared to the placebo treated group. And using this method, one can calculate uh, vaccine efficacy percentage. So both the European Medicines Agency and the Food and Drugs Administration have defined the minimal efficacy for a COVID-19 vaccine as being at least 50%. Um, and just to put that in scale, here are some efficacy data for current vaccines that are on the market. Um, so, you know, most vaccines that we're using are sort of at the 80, 90%. Um, but of course, the seasonal flu vaccine, which we know have a lot of variation, is often lower than 50%. Um, but thankfully, both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines have turned out to be much more effective um, than expected. Okay, so let's go talk about those two vaccines. So first of all, the Pfizer BioNTech mRNA vaccine, um, it's design is that it encodes the full length spike protein um, in mRNA form in, of course, a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, the gene or the, the mRNA sequence that encodes the spike protein contains two proline mutations, and the proline mutations ensure that it's um, stabilized in this format. The dosing that has been accepted based on trial results is 30 uh, micrograms uh, over two doses, 21 days apart. So in early preclinical testing, um, it was found that in rhesus macaques, um, the, this, pro, um, or this vaccine was able to produce neutralizing antibodies um, in rhesus macaques over two months period. And also um, upon viral challenge, uh, this vaccine helped to ensure that there was lower respiratory, um, that less, few, sorry, that fewer um, virus particles ended up in the lower respiratory tract. In subsequent phase one trials, um, which were again, mostly focused on reactogenicity, they found that uh, this vaccine did lead to mild to moderate injection pain. Um, and this was more frequent at the second injection. Um, but it was also less frequent in senior participants as opposed to younger participants. And in phase two and three trials, uh, they found that um, this vaccine was able to produce higher neutralizing antibody titers than from patients who caught COVID. Um, and this vaccine was also able to produce strong CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cell responses. So the final interim report that we've received most recently show that um, vaccine efficacy for this vaccine um, is 94.8% where in a full treatment group, um, they found 100 uh, cases of COVID in the placebo group. Um, sorry, in, they found 100 cases of COVID in the treatment group, and they found 550 cases in the placebo group. Um, within these cases, they sort of uh, categorized based on severe or non-severe cases, and they found that nine out of the 10 severe cases were in the placebo group, while only one was in the treatment group, which um, which suggested that this vaccine not only helped to reduce the chance of someone catching COVID, but it also helped to reduce the chance of someone getting severe symptoms from catching COVID. Um, from these results, uh, the Pfizer BioNTech um, vaccine have been sort of have applied uh, to be used for emergency authorization, um, and it's known that um, as an mRNA vaccine, its stability is maybe not the best. So its storage conditions needs to be at negative 70 degrees Celsius, um, but it is able uh, to be um, fairly stable at uh, around like four degrees Celsius for up to five days. Um, so the status as of today is that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine has uh, achieved emergency uh, use authorization for individuals aged 16 and above. Um, this authorization was initially um, uh, obtained um, from the UK on December 2nd and then was obtained within the US on December 11th. Um, it's also been approved in other countries, including Canada and Singapore. Moving on to the Moderna vaccine, very similar in design, again, encodes the full length spike protein and it also has those two stabilizing proline mutations. Um, Preclinical testing of the Moderna vaccine has shown that in rhesus macaques, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, neutralizing antibodies were again observed 
And also um, the respiratory system was again protected from subsequent viral challenge. In phase one trials, um, similar to what was found in the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, they found that there was um, reactogenicity in terms of like moderate pain and also in this case fatigue. And this was again, more frequent, um, more, more frequently discovered at, at the second injection. <laughs> Um, now, the interesting thing about the Moderna vaccine, the interesting thing about the Moderna vaccine is that because it is actually the first um, COVID vaccine to go into human trials, we kind of have a little bit more long-term data off of it. So recently, um, Moderna published um, phase three trial results where they followed up on phase three, part uh, sorry, phase one participants um, over the process of three months, and they found that in these participants, um, the titer for neutralizing antibodies um, was still fairly well maintained after the three month point. Um, in subsequent phase two and three trials, um, although the results have not yet formally been published, um, we know um, from their interim report that uh, the, they found 92 cases in the placebo group, uh, which is shown here in blue, and only six cases in the treatment group in red. Um, and of the 11 severe cases they identified, all 11 of them were found in the placebo group. Um, and so based on this so far, um, they've determined that their vaccine efficacy is at 93.5%. And this is based on seven days after the second dose. Um, compared to the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, uh, the stability of this vaccine is a little bit better. Um, and <laughs> the storage here should actually say minus 20. Um, but it, the, the stability of this vaccine is a little bit better compared to the Pfizer one. Okay, so um, as with the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine was recently approved uh, for emergency use in the US. Um, so far, it hasn't yet to be approved for use anywhere else. Um, so now that we've covered the two vaccines that have been approved for emergency use thus far, um, I'll pass the baton off to Esther to talk about what all of this might mean for us. Awesome, thank you, Lucy. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. All right, um, can everybody see my screen fine? Yes, okay. All right, um, so, oh, here we go. Okay, so as we all know, um, you know, both vaccines, um, Pfizer and Moderna's, used a uh, very similar technology, but uh, novel technology nonetheless, which is strands of mRNA held within uh, lipid nanoparticles. So like Lucy mentioned, this is vulnerable to degradation at room temperature, and it requires doses to be frozen for transportation and then thawed for use. All right, so um, some of the immediate questions to answer now that these uh, vaccines have been uh, approved for emergency, um, that's where, um, like Lucy said, the Moderna, in terms of the temperature and its stability, that's where the Moderna vaccine may have an edge. So unlike the Pfizer's and BioNTech offering, it doesn't have to be a store at minus 70, but it can tolerate much warmer um, temperatures, minus 20 temperatures, which is standard for most hospital and pharmacy freezers. So that difference means that Moderna's vaccine should be easier to distribute and store, particularly in the rural United States or United States or any rural areas really, and developing countries that you know lack an ultra cold freezers. Still, relying on ultra cold chain is obviously really expensive, and in some places it may it may uh, make more sense to just distribute a vaccine that can tolerate warmer temperatures, even if it's less effective. So that's also one of the reasons why other vaccine technologies that are you know almost uh, at the end stage of this race of clinical trials may be needed um, for these circumstances. So. Um, on, on the shipment, uh, places like Michigan or Belgium, for example, Pfizer will or has packed shipments of like 200 to 1,000 vials, each containing five doses in insulated boxes, so with thermal sensors or in dry ice to provide the necessary chill. 
So pharmacies and doctor's offices that lack ultra cold freezers can store them in, um, you know, in the thermal box for about two weeks by refi refilling the um, dry eyes every five days. And then when this is, once this is removed, like Lucy explained, the vaccine can be refrigerated for uh, five days. Um, so the companies uh, give the mRNA some, some protection during production and storage, obviously, by inserting it into the uh, into a carrier. Um, but you know, um, like also Luce Luce mentioned, the lipid also shields the mRNA from then ribonucleases in the blood once it has been injected. So uh, once it has been injected, it protects the mRNA until it makes it eventually to the cell. So this is just to highlight that actually the temperature is important to allow the, to allow the lipid nanoparticle to be stable enough to, for the mRNA to enter the cell. All right. So as Lucy mentioned, um, safety and speed of the trials has been a uh, very um, a huge concern for everybody. Um, but really uh, some questions uh, have been like, how has it been possible to develop a, a vaccine so fast in a, safety, in a safely manner? So COVID-19 vaccines were tested, like you was explained in large clinical trials to make sure they met the safety standards. Many people were recruited to participate in these trials and these trials to see how the vaccine offer protection uh, to people of different ages, different races and ethnicities. Um, as well as with different comorbidities and medical conditions. So the research actually that helped develop, helped to develop vaccines against the new coronavirus, coronaviruses, however, didn't start, start in January. So for years, um, you know, researchers had been paying attention to related coronaviruses, which cause SARS and Mars, and some had been working on um, actually new kinds of vaccine for these viruses. So it, this has been an effort that has now paid off spectacular, spectacularly. And additionally, we have to take into consideration, obviously, that these trials were in a unique situation. Um, you know, where companies and institutions pretty much had a limited funding and also had a very high, enroll, uh, high enrollment of trial participants, which usually is a problem, um, and which definitely accelerated the clinical trials. And also on a cautious note, um, of course, since these are just recently approved for emergency vaccines, there are still some data that we're missing. Uh, for example, these vaccines probably need more testing on um, pregnant women, um, women who are breastfeeding or children. Um, another immediate question to um, answer after these FDA um, approval, emergency approval is reinfection. So people who had COVID are recommended to get the vaccine after they have recovered. And many people may ask themselves why. Um, so the vaccine trials in, included people who were previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 um, and the vaccine was found to be safe for them. Because we don't also, we do not know, we do not have enough data to know how long antibodies last after infection. And a small number of people have had uh, more severe second bouts of infection. Uh, so the vaccine can be uh, beneficial in boosting a person's existing immunity from infection. And additionally, it's important to know that after vaccination, one must keep, must keep social distancing and must you know, keep continuing wearing a mask because we don't really have enough data just yet to show whether a person or how a person can be still an asymptomatic carrier um, to others that can have not been vaccinated yet or that simply do not want to be vaccinated, which I will get into much detail later. Another question is, um, with so many cases and literally the entire world almost wanted the vaccine, do we have enough vaccines? So while we cannot know for sure if both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are provided in the quantities um, they estimate producing, it is expected that by the summer of 2021, most people who, again, want a COVID-19 vaccine should be able to receive it. As long as they do not have you know, a contraindication that prevents, um, that prevents them from receiving these versions of the vaccine, Likewise, like Lucy, like Lucy mentioned, there's um, a lot of vaccines that are at the end of the race of these clinical trials at end um, phase um, three trials. And so, of course, um, you know, it is possible that vaccines uh, 
produced, for example, by Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, will become available during 2021. And of course, that could help these projections. And additionally, because of the temper temperature advances that I was talking about before, uh, among other, other things such as like contraindications or allergies, additional vaccines without such strict temperature conditions will be obviously beneficial to make a vaccine accessible worldwide. So there are clinical, so now let's talk a little bit about mRNA based um, therapies, because these are, like Lucy mentioned, therapies that were not approved until now, which have, they have been approved for emergency approval, but still there are the first ones to be in the market. Um, there are clear benefits to nucleic acid vaccines beyond their immunogeneity. Unlike all other black vaccine platforms, excuse me, the nucleic acid vaccine production does not rely on live vaccine samples or other, other biological systems, which is important. So the genomic material can be quickly and cheaply reproduced in a test tube. The only knowledge about the sequence, the only knowledge that we need is um, its, its sequence for the vaccine design. So in theory, this minimalistic approach should allow um, the same development pipeline to be applied for a large variety of pathogen targets, making this platform hopefully suitable for future, future vaccine development. However, um, we have to be cautious because there are still challenges, challenges that need to be overcome. And we have to think that this is a fairly new technology that although has, it has been explored before for many other vaccines, um, it, like I said, it's the first one to be approved for emergency purposes. So for example, while the relative, relative instability and inefficient delivery of nuclear material has been resolved by this living nanoparticle that we were talking about, the vaccine technology still needs to be around minus 70 um, to be stable, making storage and transportation harder, like we uh, mentioned before. So moreover, this technology has a short life. So hopefully future technological developments and efforts to concentrate RNA vaccine immunogeneity into a single dose will negate some of these uh, administrative challenges in the coming years that we have um, at the moment. Obviously, another challenge um, is the fact that since RNA vaccines have not been commercialized before, like we were mentioning, little is known about their safety profile and especially long term efficacy. Um, so, so far, you know, phase, phase three um, safety data have been largely positive, of course, as we have seen um, in the available clinical data and as Lucy has shown. Um, but we have to keep in mind that these trials are unlikely to identify rare adverse effects during, due to the limit in participant size and can only provide information on short term effects uh, observed in the last you know, few months as the trial was ongoing. But also, and very importantly, and I feel that sometimes undervalued, is that we have to keep in mind that most side effects in, um, you know, during vaccine trials or during vaccine administration happen around four to six um, weeks post injection. And the FDA requires for at least 60 day post injection data. So since the half life of the um, you know, since the half-life of the RNA material in the body is only a matter um, of hours, and these vaccines do not contain any other viral material, these treatments are probably unlikely to trigger, to trigger unexpected long-term long adverse effects. Um, you know, but on a cautious note, like I was saying, this technology is the first of its kind to be um, emergency approved. Mm -hmm. So cautions, vigilance must be maintained to determine the long-term efficacy and safety of these vaccines over the next months, and also to determine the suitability of this platform for future therapies. Um, so thinking ahead, can we protect ourselves for future uh, coronaviruses? So like Lucy was mentioning, SARS-CoV-2 shares about 80 to 90% of sequence identity um, to SARS or SARS-CoV-1, and about 50% sequence identity um, to Mars. So in addition, both SARS-CoV-1 and both in COVID-2 um, infects whole cells by binding to the AC1, uh, AC2 sorry, re receptor, like Lucy was explaining, via highly similar spike proteins. So that's why I was mentioning before that this level of con conservation within members of the coronavirus family has allowed much of the knowledge gained during the 2002 SARS epidemic to be applied in the design of a COVID-19 um, you know, vaccine. 
However, when SARS disappeared suddenly in the summer of 2003, interest in funding for further development of vaccine or reliable treatments were kind of redirected into other channels. So given what is known about coronavirus um, cross-species transmission and the simple fact that three of the seven zoonotic coronaviruses to date are capable of significantly reducing our quality of life, like we have clearly seen during this pandemic, it would be imprudent to like not prepare for future coronaviruses epidemics that are very high likely, highly likely to happen. So we believe that, um, you know, Further research into coronaviruses um, and efforts to develop therapies must persist after um, COVID-19 elimination so that communities may be more prepared to respond to the next pandemic. So effort, efforts to track the biology and evolution of other coronaviruses strains should be made so that we may predict and minimize future animal to human transmission. Um, indeed, predictions of a zo second zoonotic SARS-CoV virus emerged as early as 2007. And there's actually several uh, published papers about this, but it was largely ignored. So um, with the right knowledge, preparation, and support from the scientifically driven policies, future coronaviruses, pandemics, um, you know, scan, can and should be not mitigated. So um, Lastly, uh, I think it's really important to touch upon uh, misinformation, which I think we have all seen as scientists um, in social media and TV, newspapers, pretty much everywhere. Um, and also to talk about a little bit about increased scientific transparency and how that is unique and can, can help regain public trust. So alongside the pandemic, community, communities around the world are being overwhelmed by misinformation regarding COVID-19, um, ranging from trivialization of health risks to downright fraudulent claim, claims of cures and prophylactics. I mean, at this point, I believe all of us have probably heard a lot of science fiction theories uh, about the virus and treatments at this point. Um, so while we have been focusing our efforts on treating, you know, the pandemic, rightfully so, because it's obviously really important, this infodemic has gone kind of unchecked. And science communication and transparency is crucial to maintaining public trust, especially now when, you know, everything that um, the scientific community is doing is being, is being watched and heavily scrutinized by the public eye. So currently, um, the relative obscurity and unusual speed that we were talking about, which drug companies and their academic partners have completed trials, as well as concerns over possible you know, political pressures on scientific judgment, has both degraded the public's trust in treatments and vaccines and fueled further misunderstanding. So this can lead to non-compliance when a vaccine is eventually released, which is now, and this can definitely at least delay or even prevent COVID-19 elimination if people are not taking the vaccine. So I think one of the things that um, you know, is clear to me in, um, throughout this pandemic is that there is a need of, for clearer communication during clinical trials or for clearer science communication. For example, when AstraZeneca's viral vector vaccine was tempor temporarily halted, um, you know, this was reported to be an, due to a neurological um, symptom in a, in a participant. However, when the, uh, when the trial, you know, was uh, restarted or when the pause was lifted in the U.S., the only announcement to, made to the public was that the FDA had reviewed the safety data and found it satisfactory. Nothing else was told to the public. So the absence of official reports can fuel misinformation and mistrust. And while companies need to maintain com the confidentiality of their trial participants, of course, um, they must also learn to be more pro proactive, transparent, and consistent with the public by announcing and explain explaining major decisions that the company is taking. So one way to prevent misinformation and foster trust is to make um, details regarding treatment design and clinical trial available to the broader community. So, so far, Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and more companies have all published their phase three um, trial protocols, for example. These documents include details of data collection, participant pool size, known side effects, and how the vaccine efficacy um, was determined. 
So um, EU regulators are also making an effort to improve transparency around COVID-19 treatments, um, which is great. So we believe that policies such as this foster public trust and promote science literacy over time, and that hopefully data transparency will also translate to the um, post-COVID um, world. And lastly, um, and a very important question that I want to um, raise is, Will a vaccine really end this pandemic? So public distrust might derail the COVID-19 vaccine program, uh, COVID-19, sorry. So given the atmosphere of distrust that I was talking about, it is not surprising that several studies uh, report low, bit, uh, low COVID-19 vaccine acceptance rate in the general public. So in the study, for example, conducted in June of 2020, 75% 75 75 of Americans we're willing to accept the COVID-19 vaccine that was proven safe and effective. Although it seems that these numbers th um, thankfully have increased a little bit um, or have pretty much remained the same, um, it's, it's important for us to keep in mind that um, experts cannot predict the percentage of immunized, immunized people necessary to reach COVID-19 heart immunity. But it is important to know that roughly 80% of immunization is required for the polio heart immunity, and while for the highly transmissible measles, um, you know, more than 90% of immunization is required. Therefore, the current level of vaccine hesitancy, which uh, ranges from, I would say, 60% to 75% um, determined in different studies, is worrying and may undermine vaccination efforts now that a vaccine has been approved for emergency. So unless public trust uh, for the vaccine development process is prepared, we might find ourselves with a vaccine, but with a few people willing to receive it. So moral of the story is trust in science, it saves lives. Thank you everybody for listening and we will take any questions from here. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Lucy. Thanks a lot, Esther. I think this was an excellent presentation. Um, I really like that, you know, like you start with like the, the very basics of vaccine development and what are the, let's say, aberrations in the current trials. Um, and then of course, like the, the important aspect of um, advocacy at the end. Um, so I would request everyone to send their questions by chat. I already have like a list of questions um, and I'd be passing them on to you. The very first one is that um, actually I received it from a scientist, so it is like a little bit on the on the scientific side. But since the mRNA is being trans like you know uh, translated into the spike protein itself, how do we know that this spike protein, which is you know being like manufactured inside the human cells after the vaccine, how do we know that it's safe? Like, is there any sort of prediction or data that it doesn't have a toxicity of its own? Do you mean um, if the spike protein is safe or like the vaccine per se or? Uh, the spike protein which is produced by the mRNA vaccine, you know, as the hmm. antigen to induce the antibodies. Do we know so, for sure that it doesn't have a toxicity of its own? So I believe that uh, the good thing about this technology is that we are not getting the, like Lucy was commenting on, the entire, you know, virus. Um, we are just getting up hard or even, um, you know, not even like a part of the virus, but something like an mRNA that, you know, will eventually lead to your the cell kind of like recognizing it and uh, like recognizing the spike protein once we get the infection, right? So I think this is definitely less dangerous than getting the attenuated or um, weakened version of the virus because, you know, there's no you like it's not going to reproduce um and you are still going to get hopefully the immunity so i would say that one of the things that we were highlighting is like actually in that regard at least the safety of these mrna vaccines absolutely thanks a lot I so also, so, sorry yeah. i just want to say something like, like i think it's also important to really think about um you know like what makes a virus um pathogenic right mm -hmm. so uh, a virus has, um, I think coronaviruses have like maybe 15 or 16 like virus specific proteins um, that it's sort of 
uh, encodes for including the spike protein, obviously. And then when it gets inserted um, or when it infects the cell, um, all like 15 or 16 of those proteins are made and it gets assembled and it gets taken out. So if you think about it from the perspective of the virus like biology, the spike protein actually doesn't even really end up in your host cell, right? Because it binds to the outside surface, it binds to ACE2, and then it undergoes that confirmation, half of it falls off, and then it ends up on the membrane and it doesn't really even enter your, your, like, your cell. So the viral pathogenicity is really not from the spike protein itself. So if you're just expressing the spike protein from uh, the vaccine, I think this is not a significant concern at all. Okay, very good to know. Um, so I've received a lot of questions actually about um, the efficacy of these vaccines against you know, the mutated strains, which have been highlighted now in UK and South Africa. So I, I received at least like from six people the same question that, do you think this vaccine will be effective against this mutated strain? Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a concern. Um, one thing that I do want to point out that I think is really interesting is um, if you really think about it, this, the mRNA vaccines specifically, their design um, came really early on, right? So they started designing the mRNA vaccines pretty much immediately after they had the genome from mm -hmm. the original um, COVID, I guess, cases in China. And what I think a lot of people might not have realized is that in like March and April, there already was a mutation in uh, the spike protein that has since then taken over the entirety of like the COVID population. Um, and that would have meant that any of these um, vaccines, these mRNA vaccines that were designed prior to that shift um, would have been tested in populations that experienced this new variant already. Um, so, you know, I do understand the concern, especially with this most recent um, UK mutation, because it sounds like there's a lot of changes that happened in the spike protein as opposed to like one or two mutations. Um, but one of the benefits of the mRNA um, platform is that, you know, if this does turn out to be a problem, you can just change uh, the sequence of the mRNA and you would expect things to still operate normally. Um, so I guess we'll have to see. We obviously don't have the data for it. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, when they're doing these trials, they also don't know um, which strain they're testing against, and which populations they're testing against, right? I perfectly so, agree. I think we, we probably can modulate it like we do with influenza every year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it comes to it, <laughs> we might have to update it every year. Um, but, you know, given the fact that the previous design is currently working with the current set of mutations, um, mm -hmm. I'm feel pretty positive <laughs> about the future mutations. I feel like the, the, it wouldn't cause a significant impact on vaccine uh, capability. Okay, great. Um, so I'll move on to the next question and that's, that's actually um, a very interesting one. Um, um, like, you know, and like somebody asked me that back, you know, in the seventies and eighties when like new drugs were launched or vaccines were launched, a lot of scientists were doing these self trials right? With something similar to what they also did in this um, 2011 movie, right? It's like they did a self-trial and after that they launched the, the, the vaccine. So, so a few people have been concerned that have the scientists been taking these vaccines themselves and why is it not reported and why is it not highlighted? It's an interesting one. I know it's, a, it's, it's not really a scientific question, but I thought I would bring it up because perhaps a lot of people are concerned about this? Um, I think, I definitely think it's a good question. Um, it's, it's a different question. Um, I don't think the scientists have been taking the, I mean, I don't know, obviously, I don't have the answer to this. Um, there's obviously, you know, the scientific community is always eager to learn, eager to try uh, new things. And maybe, you know, some people may even try that on themselves. Um, I don't think we have enough evidence to say yes or no to this question. Um, it's definitely an interesting thought and it definitely happened before, but um, I really don't think we have a definite answer to this just yet, <laughs> at least. I mean, there are definitely people in the scientific community who are like, you know, who have enrolled themselves into trials. Yeah. So, we do have a trial at Columbia that we could have been involved in had mm -hmm. we want to, but not only as a scientist, but also like, you know, 
the other population around New York. It's just for like the convenience of Columbia being there. Um, we do have access to trial as scientists, but you know, like the rest of the community also does. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any rogue activity happening. <laughs> Um, okay, so moving on to the next one, um, and that is um, like, you know, again, a question came from a scientist because recently there was this paper in Nature Metabolism in which they found out that um, SARS-CoV-2 also relies on this other receptor for viral entry, this SRB1, you know, the HDL receptor. So now as we slowly find out that it's not only the ACE receptor, but other receptors which might be implicated, do you think the virus like, you know, how, how would that change the whole um, dynamic of viral entry and being neutralized by antibodies against the spike protein? Or what should we do at least to sort of be prepared for that? Well, I, I think it opens, it also opens like new, a new horizon for, for therapies too, right? If we are, um, we have like more things to think about targeting if you want that only not AC2. Um, so I think, I, I want to think about it as like also a positive thing, not only a negative thing. It also offers more, hopefully, druggable targets for the future. Um, yeah. The um, interaction that you're speaking of, um, the SRB1, was it? Yeah. S yeah, S SRB1 um, is sort of binding to like the S1 portion of the spike protein. So that's the part of the spike protein that comes off um, when the S2 portion binds to AC2. Oh. Yeah, so in, in if we're, you know, if we're still making antibodies against the spike protein, um, it wouldn't actually impact um, the like activity of, of the vaccine. Um, but, you know, that is something interesting to think about, like what is that S1 component doing once it gets released? Yeah. But that's, that's excellent. That's good to know that it will still be, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a separate protein that it's binding to. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Um, now, I have a question of my own as well, um, you know, which, which is related to this um, new bioarchive paper, you know, from, uh, from Rudolf Janesch, so, you know, big name, and it got a lot of publicity about SARS-CoV-2 um, hijacking the line one elements in human cells and getting incorporated um, into the genome. Um, how does that change the whole, like, you know, vaccine landscape and, like, how like do you think it will have um, any yeah so um well for those of like the people that are here um i mean the, definitely the authors talk a lot of very important questions so for the audience um i think the paper that you're talking about is like the sars-cov-2 rna reverse transcribed and integrated into the human genome um i haven't like I have not thoroughly gone through the paper, but I have definitely like read it um, just because like you said, it got a lot of attention. Um, I honestly think that the data presented in this preprint is kind of like insufficient to claim that SARS-CoV-2 is reverse transcribed and integrated into the human genome. Um, there are several reasons to that. Um, like for example, like the research I believe it involves like the genetic manipulation of SARS-CoV-2 to begin with, which we don't really have much knowledge just yet about like genetic recombination between SARS-CoV-2 and exogenous sequences, for example. Um, another big thing that they say, like, you know, they talk about retrotransposition events. When you're talking about this, um, you know, the standard in the field is kind of to like isolate and report the sequence of like the integrins along like the Blanking, you know, genome sequences, um, which can be, you know, achieved using a bunch of very simple PCR-based approaches, um, you know, and also like whole genome sequencing or like high throughput sequencing. The authors, although, like you said, of course, they're like a big name in the field. I believe they're from Harvard, but you know, none of these approaches um, are flawless. Of course, that I mentioned about, but they didn't do any of this. And also really importantly for me too, they didn't report any junction sequences of like the integrants or the sides of chromosomal integration in the DNA, right? None of this was reported. So I think that for example, these sequences are critical because it provides not only validation of chromosomal integration, but also important clues about like the mechanism of integration, right? Um, I don't know, I, they, I think the authors did like qPCR and RNA fish 
which I think they are like a little inadequate approaches to prove like genomic integration. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, I need a lot more convincing for this, <laughs> for it's sure. Very you, I mean, it, it warrants further study, but, um, yeah. but I think in terms of, um, so that's how I interpreted it. And I would like to run it by you that even let's say, even if it does get incorporated into the genome, it actually, one, it doesn't mean that the viral vaccine mRNA will get incorporated because in the end, it's not the nucleocapsid protein which interacts with the Lineman elements. And secondly, what it means is that there is even a greater need to have the vaccine so that you can prevent the virus from even entering the cells before it incorporates into the genome. So- Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, um this is gonna happen even if you let's say are HIV positive and uh, have like um, you know the um, what you need to get um, like RNA from RNA to go to DNA um, you like either you will have um, the AIDS disease and therefore you will be immune suppressed so you shouldn't be taking any vaccines as it is or you will be taking a cocktail of drugs that will make you like the virus won't be even PCR detectable and therefore it doesn't really matter and you can take um you know you can get vaccinated. So I don't think I, I really don't think this paper provides like, enough data or support or experiments to um you know claim something as big as they claim. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to keep you guys around for a little bit longer because we have like a few more questions. So let me quickly ask the, again, the one which I got from like a number of people, like at least 10, 15 different people. And that was that, is there any possibility that this mRNA vaccine can get incorporated into the genome? In, if someone is HIV positive, if someone is taking like a drug against otherwise, but is there any possibility at all? I don't or think so. rather, <laughs> I think I think we should. We, I think we can think of this a little bit differently. There is no um, foreseeable reason why there will be a higher risk of this mRNA getting incorporated into your genome as opposed to any other mRNA in your body in every single cell. Um, we don't quite know um, how the mRNA vaccine is designed, obviously, because a lot of the, the actual design is still sort of like a secret. Right. Um, but, you know, knowing what we know about mRNAs, it's probably capped, it's probably tailed, it probably has, you know, the basic things. And so when it actually gets into your cells, it should look and resemble like any other mRNA in your cell at the time. So I don't foresee the reason why we should be more worried about this than just yours, you know, normal things in your cells. And yeah, like someone in the, in the comments mentioned, mRNA gets degraded very quickly. So it's really not I think it's it's not a reasonable concern. Right, and um, another couple of questions which are sort of like about, again, the, the structure of the vaccine. So one question is that, are, is it like modified, like ribonucleotides? Is it like, you know, what's, what's the reason that they keep on expanding, you know, once they have been injected? That's number one. Number two, um, someone asked if there is any detectable immune response against the RNA because it's also foreign RNA, right? Um, so the first question was about whether or not it expands. And like, it, it, is it modified? Are there your ribonucleotides modified? And is it the reason why they keep on expanding once they're... Uh, once they're um, so I, I don't think the vaccine expands. I think there's a certain amount that they inject in um, and it's not going to replicate um, okay. mm -hmm. inside. So there's no expansion there. There is um, some modification. So we know from the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine um, that they have a pseudouridine modified mRNA. Um, and this modification leads to enhanced stability and higher translational capacity. Um, and it's also meant to be like less reactogenic than regular mRNA. So that sort of uh, crosses back to that second question there. Um, because of course the body is used to not seeing mRNA um, randomly like floating around outside. So normally, if you do have uh, exposed naked mRNA, um, your innate immune system will respond very strongly to that. Um, and so a lot of these um, mRNA vaccines are actually sort of designed to try and like dampen that response a little bit. I um, mean, it's also the reason why um, you see so much more like moderate adverse reactions, especially um, when you go in for that second booster shot, because 
you know, your body is like responding to it more heavily. So um, we know the um, Pfizer BioNTech one is modified. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure if the same modification is happening um, with the, the Moderna one, but yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat here. I, 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 I try to be as quick as possible. So um, someone asked if they're like, you know, what's the minimal um, observational time, like, you know, if we followed the normal protocol and not this emergency protocol. So previously, what will be the minimum time for a trial? Um, so I would say the most important time, like I mentioned, is um, you know, post vaccination to wait at least um, over two months or like around two months because the mo I mean, the most severe, there's some really severe, like an, an anaphylactic shock things that could happen right away. Obviously, if you're like severely allergic to the vaccine, but then some, most of the um, side effects will happen around um, two months, two months, like four to six weeks. Um, so that's what really is needed. Obviously, long term side effects are also really, really important. But you know, in this situation, we couldn't, we couldn't have that because we would have needed to wait um, more years. So this will, will be what we're, what it's happening now, though, it's like this vaccine is being monitored, like every single person who's getting the shot is being monitored very, very closely. So anything that happens will get reported. So there's no reason to think that um, like severe long-term effects uh, or long, uh, long um, side effects, sorry, will happen. Um, but we also have to think that this vaccine is gonna get administered to millions of people and that we are mon gonna monitor all of them. So severe effects or like side effects, sorry, will happen and will be reported. And it's it's important to understand that that is normal. And then that every single vaccine, every single drug out there has side effects. And the more people that, you know, take these drugs or these vaccines, the more people, the more side effects we are going to have. But when we also get side effects, it's important to, to like, take a look at the population and see the basal of those side effects, right? Because we're maybe looking at something that the population has and that it wasn't just triggered by, by the vaccine, but it's, you know, it's something common that just the population has like this um, neurologic effect. There's people who just have that. So maybe it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be triggered by, by the vaccine. So these are things that we have to take into the consideration. Of course, anything that we put in our bodies that it's foreign, any drugs, any vaccines, we have the potential to have side effects, but you know, that's normal. That has to be accepted. And at, at the end, we have to think about the risk benefit balance. And it's like having some side effects, maybe, you know, feeling a little down for a couple of days because your body is building an immune response to the virus versus, you know, getting COVID and my getting intubated in the hospital, you know? So it's like a risk balance here that we have to, you know, consider, consider I think. All right, that's an excellent point. I mean, in the end, this mass vaccination is actually an ongoing trial, right? I mean, we are learning as we go. Yeah. And like, I mean, what, what we are saying now, yeah. perhaps things would be different six months down the line. But um, also any, any vaccine or any drug that gets like approved automatically moves into what we call phase two, a uh, phase four, sorry, trial. So really anything that enters the market is monitored for long-term side effects. So this is happening right now because we obviously have less data, but it happens with anything that goes out in the market really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'll actually end with like, um, like a quick comment from both of you um, about this question, which was simply, you know, someone said that like, I'm very skeptical about this whole thing. Can you convince me in two lines? <laughs> so, so how would you convince someone who is like a skeptic? So for me, I think our job is not to convince anybody to take the vaccine as scientists. I personally, I am gonna take it when it's available, but that is my decision. I think our job as scientists is to make the information available and understandable and comprehensive for everybody, make them know the truth, like the good truth and the bad truth and let them make their decision. But the decision has to be based on real data, 
on real science and not on science fiction that they see on the internet. My job is not to convince anybody to take the vaccine. My job is to make you have the real trustworthy resources to decide for yourself. So I think that is, that's my answer to that. <laughs> I mean, do you want all of COVID or just part of the COVID? <laughs> <laughs> um, but jokes aside, though, like I do agree with Esther on this point. Um, you know, this is an important decision that has to be made personally um, for all of us. And, you know, what we're really hoping to do today is to hopefully, you know, um, excite um, some interest in these vaccines and get people really talking about it. So, you know, don't let us talk you into doing it. You know, actually go and read up for yourself and like figure out what it is. and you know, talk to your peers and chat about it and talk to your family and chat about it. So, um, you know, we hope we can like pass on this like interest in science forward. And even if you decide this round that you want to wait a little bit longer, that's fine. As long as you're actively thinking about it, it's a good thing. But if you go ahead and read, read from trustworthy sources. <laughs> that's really important. <laughs> Again, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly add that um, you guys have done a great service with your review article and especially like, you know, also with this, with these very didactic lectures and the Q&As which have followed. Um, we'll disseminate it, you know, on all the resources like uh, within our institute, together with EMBL on like, you know, our personal resources. And, and I think it, it's, um, I, I really like the approach that in the end, it's, it's science, it's facts, it's logic. Like, you know, we are not taking any particular side, but we know that we are convinced by what we see. And we are laying it out in a way that you can read and make up your own mind. So thanks a lot again for, uh, for doing it on such a short notice and for like excellent didactic lectures and like very engaging discussions. Um, this really means a lot, I, was, I believe, not only for, for me and like, you know, our scientific community, but but I think now we also feel way more equipped to answer all these questions which we come across. And sometimes, you know, like if you're a neuroscientist, you don't know how to answer these things. But now I think we all have the baseline with which we can convince people. So thanks again. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, so for joining for us for all the questions. Um, it's definitely been a thorough pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye to everyone. Uh, but by the way, this has been recorded, um, and with the permission of Esther and Lucy, we'll be sharing it on all the possible resources, so you can also disseminate wherever you feel like. Thank you. Sure thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.